and I have the honor and privilege of uh, introducing our next speaker, um, Alicia Garza. And Alicia Garza founded the Black Futures Lab to make Black communities powerful in politics. In 2018, the Black Futures Lab conducted the largest survey of Black communities in over 150 years. Many of you are familiar with Alicia as one of the co-creators of Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter Global Network, an international organizing project to end state violence and oppression against Black people, which now has 40 chapters in four countries. She is an innovator, strategist, and organizer who believes that Black communities deserve what all communities deserve, to be powerful in every aspect of their lives. Alicia also serves as the Strategy and Partnerships Director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the nation's premier voice for millions of domestic workers in the United States. I was first honored to be in Alicia's presence when I attended the Black Women's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. She was one of the uh, uh, speakers on day one uh, who focused on witnessing and, and testifying the right to truth and memory. Her words were powerful and moving as she spoke about what the nation owes to Black women. In 2019, I was fortunate enough to once again share space with her as we each spoke with members of the unit, union, United Server, Service Workers West, inspiring those in labor to look at each of our respective roles and responsibilities to transform the way that we do our work in order to change our conditions. Her large vision has stood as an inspiration and a call to action to many of us in the nation and worldwide. Alicia has a forthcoming book that I hope that you'll be looking out for. It's tentatively titled, How to Turn a Hashtag into a Movement, which will be published uh, in 2020, hopefully this year. And she warns you, hashtags don't start movements, people do. We are so grateful that Alicia was able to carve out time in her demanding schedule to be with us this morning. She is one bold woman, and we couldn't think of anyone more appropriate to help us wrap up NSAC's 2020 plenary sessions. So with that, I'd love to ask Alicia uh, to uh, inspire us and challenge us. Thank you so much, Sandra, and thank you so much to everyone who's gathered here today. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and an honor really to be able to share some thoughts with you all about how it is that we make this movement truly intersectional. I wanna start off by saying that I am a survivor of sexual assault. I was in high school, he was somebody who I knew, and for more than a decade, starting from the age of 12, I worked as a sexual health peer educator. I taught my peers about safe sex and consent, and I'm still a survivor of sexual assault. I know years and years later, it wasn't my fault that power operates to subjugate our bodies and our agency. And even still, I rarely talk about my assault. I just wear it like many of us survivors do, like a tattoo that's gone horribly wrong. To be able to have worked that long <clears throat> in the sexual health space, teaching my peers about consent, and still to have been subjected to sexual assault, to still believe that what happened to me was not assault, is not an aberration. It's a result of the field that I was developed in. Sexual assault was seen as race neutral, devoid of any kind of political analysis that was related to power or privilege. And that is why it took me so long to understand that what happened to me was rape, was violence. Because in the world that I was trained in, the world that we're all trained in, rape is something that happens to innocent white girls. Racial justice and sexual violence are intricately linked. I learned about these connections during my time as a volunteer with San Francisco Women Against Rape, who 
I would say is one of the organizations that really helped to shape not just my understanding of this field, but my understanding of what it means to build power in a world that is hell-bent on keeping us from being able to actualize our full dignity. It was there that I began to understand the unique challenges facing Black women and women of color, trans women, gender nonconforming people, as it relates to sexual violence. As a medical advocate and a hotline counselor there, I learned about the ways in which race and gender, class, disability, citizenship, sexuality, impact different ones of us differently as it relates to the violence that is enacted on our bodies and on our spirits. But I also learned at San Francisco Women Against Rape the ways in which those identities, those power dynamics, also shape our responses to violence, to assault, and it prohibits us from creating the kinds of world that we all deserve to live in. I'm often asked nowadays, seven years after helping to co-create Black Lives Matter with my sisters, Opal, Tometi, and Patrice Cullors, about how organizations and companies um, can be better equipped to live the values of Black Lives Matter. And I have to admit that most of the time when I'm asked that question, I'm a little bit taken aback because it does seem so simple to me. You know, one of the things that we have to be mindful of here is that in this moment where Black Lives Matter has become a global rallying cry, that it is still far, far too easy to use this movement as symbol rather than to challenge ourselves to extract the substance of this movement in order to completely transform the institutions that we build to address the challenges that exist in our communities. It's too often that Black Lives Matter gets used as a brand that makes people feel good, that I in particular get used as somebody who people can say, well, Alicia Garza came and talked to us and therefore we don't have any problems with racism or white supremacy or homophobia or transphobia or patriarchy or ableism or xenophobia. And the fact of the matter is, every single time that happens, I become even clearer that we have more work to do than we can possibly imagine. I wanna be very, very clear with each of us. The work to make Black Lives Matter starts with us. It starts in the institutions that we build to provide alternatives to the institutions that continue to criminalize us, to marginalize us, to oppress us, to discriminate against us. It's too easy to say that in organizations that are fighting for our agency and our rights, that we are not at the same time reproducing the same dynamics that create harm that fail to keep us safe, and that fail to prevent little girls like me from ever having had our agency stripped away from us. So the first thing that we can do is to examine the environment around us, not necessarily on a global scale, not necessarily on a national scale, but inside of the vehicles that we are building, hopefully to build power. We can look at our boards and ask ourselves, not just are, are, are the right people represented here? <laughs> because you can have a black person on your board, you can have a Latinx person on your board, you can even have a trans person on your board and still be anti-black. You can still be xenophobic. You can still be transphobic. We have to be asking ourselves, what are the ways in which we are embedding our values of a world free of violence free of harm and accountable when harm is created? What are the ways in which we are embedding those values right here in our organizations? I mentioned earlier that for me coming up in, the, in this movement, so many of the frameworks that we were being taught that we were also propagating were frankly anti-Black. They were, they were frameworks that were telling us that race was not a problem in this movement, and that race was not a problem in relationship to the harms that we were experiencing. We were being taught that to be political inside of these advocacy arms and inside of these advocacy organizations 
was issues that we should take up on our own time. But the fact of the matter is that kind of approach creates more harm than it creates good. And that being too afraid to challenge our own failures and our own weaknesses prevents us from being as powerful, as visionary, and as liberatory as we deserve to be. It prevents us from being the kinds of organizations that survivors deserve. It prevents us from creating the kinds of solutions that are not just temporary stop gaps from assault, but that fundamentally transform our society. And so in that, in preventing those changes, we ourselves are being cowards. I want to be very, very clear. Black Lives Matter is not just about police violence. It's not just about police brutality. It's about creating a world and creating institutions where Black lives are valued. And what it means to value Black lives is to make sure that Black perspectives and Black experiences are leading our strategies, that we're not just being consulted when it's convenient, but that we are an intricate part of the fabric of the vehicles who are fighting for us. I want to just close by saying this. Well, I actually have a few more things to say. I'm not going to close yet. <laughs> Let me just also acknowledge that this work is hard that sometimes what it means to challenge anti-Blackness, sometimes what it means to challenge patriarchy, sometimes what it means to challenge transphobia is for ourselves to be uncomfortable and for ourselves to be called to account. I know that growing up in this country and in this world, we are taught that racism and all of the other isms are individual failings that are temporarily mistakes. We get taught that racism is about people being mean to each other, as opposed to a series of interlocking rules and practices that are rigged against our communities for the purposes of consolidating and excluding people from the power and the agency that allows us to live well. And so if we're taught that racism or any other ism is a result of individual failings, then we think that the only thing that is necessary to address it is either to stop talking about it or to address uh, personality issues. Be nicer to one another. Say African-American instead of black. Make sure you have that one trans person on your board so that you don't be seen as transphobic. But that in and of itself is a part of how this system functions. It teaches us to isolate from each other and to isolate the problems that we face every single day. It prevents us from drawing connections between why it is that so many of us are being excluded from power and what it is that we can do about it. I also believe very deeply in us. I believe that with the right amount of courage, the right amount of determination, the ability to make mistakes and to roll up your sleeves and dust off your knees and your elbows again and say, I'm going to go back to the drawing board and I'm going to try and I'm going to do better. I believe that we can do that, but it requires each of us to call each other to account. I hear a lot of things these days about cancel culture, and I have to be honest, I just don't buy it. I actually think that we have a hard time navigating conflict and that we believe that conflict means that we are inherently bad people, similarly to how we understand racism. But fundamentally, being called to account from a place of love, from a place of believing that we can be better and wanting to step forward and hold each other accountable to that for the sake of our collective futures, not only is it no small task, but it's essential. And so rather than you know uh, uh, um, pulling ourselves apart, trying not to hold each other accountable for the harms that we are creating, I think we have to learn how to navigate conflict in such a way where we keep our eyes on the prize. And the eyes on the prize means this, conflict is inevitable, it is natural, and it is needed. And what happens in conflict is that we can choose whether uh, uh, that conflict allows us and forces us to break the bonds between us, or whether it forces us to uh, connect in such a way that we commit to strengthening those bonds, even though we have um, come apart. 
Earlier, Sandra, you mentioned my upcoming book, which is actually coming up very soon. It's out in October. And the, perp and the title of this book is The Purpose of Power, How We Come Together When We Fall Apart. I want to challenge our movement. I want to challenge this movement to do the things that are necessary to figure out how it is that we've, we come together, though we have fallen very, very far apart. Some of the things that I talk about in that book is that part of the process of figuring out how we do that is through a level of self-examination, but it's also through a process of understanding how power dynamics work, not only around us, but on us, how we learn and unlearn and relearn things that we've been taught that through no fault of our own. But that now that we are aware, every choice we make in relationship to those things that shape us uh, matter in this moment. So really now in closing, I'd like to just say this. There are incredible models in this movement of how it is that we can build the kinds of institutions that survivors deserve. I named one earlier with San Francisco Women Against Rape being an incredible vehicle that has gone through decades decades of struggle and consequences to become the kind of organization that survivors can count on, that survivors can shape, that survivors can depend upon to be a powerful vehicle for our own agency. But there are many others throughout this movement. And I do believe that there are contributions that each of those organizations have to make to guiding this part of our movement to being better, to doing better, and to achieving and winning more. We have to achieve and win more. We live in perilous times. We live in a country that is now being led by a, a, a perpetrator, <laughs> by somebody who continues to advance harm at our expense. We don't have time to wait and we don't have time to be timid. The time is now for us to call ourselves to account, to be the best that we can be, for the America that we all deserve. Thank you so much, Calcasa. Thank you so much, Sandra, for having me. And I hope that you all continue to get bolder and stronger in this fight. And I'm right next to you doing the same.